Hey everybody, Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine here with another edition of In the Workshop and the return of a very special guest who I'll introduce here in a moment. Um, what's he, what's we going to talk about today? Electrical testing. The probably the thing most techs face with some trepidation <laughs> to say the very least. Uh, but this gentleman has been helping techs overcome their discomfort with testing electrical systems for a long time. Uh, I'm very proud to welcome once again Mr. Vince Fischelli. Vince, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, Pete. How are you? Oh, just awesome. Just awesome. I know you've got a lot of material that we're going to try to get through, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and bring your material up here front for everyone to be able to see and share and turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a presentation about a, a book I wrote called Electrical Troubleshooting Shortcuts. And <clears throat> I've been training since, oh my, about 1985, I started training full time. And in those days, electrical troubleshooting was a real problem for many technicians. And today, almost 30 years, well, 30 years later, it's still a problem. And as, <clears throat> as I go around the country and do training and people come to Dallas and attend my workshops, uh, I find that what they consider electrical troubleshooting most of the time is changing parts. And when the parts don't fix the problem, then they get frustrated and have difficulty and spend a lot of time and money uh, wasting time, a lot of vehicle downtime for fleets because of incorrect electrical troubleshooting. But, you know, today we live in a world where automotive technology is very advanced. We have CAN bus and all sorts of technologies, OBD2. And what this does is it causes a technician to focus a lot on the advanced system technologies and diagnostic systems that we have while neglecting the essential electrical troubleshooting principles relating to battery problems, cranking problems, and charging system problems. But the fact remains, if this part of the vehicle is overlooked, you can have considerable difficulties trying to repair an electrical problem because the problem relates to a battery failure of some type, which we're going to discuss, or something about the uh, cranking circuit that's not working correctly and of course the charging system which is the electrical power source for the vehicle while the vehicle is running. So problems in these areas are often overlooked or dealt with in, in a haphazard manner. So as a result of that when I started doing training in 85 I started putting get a little handouts and I would do these sessions and as the years went by I would update the handouts and eventually got to the point where the handout got so thick and it, it left some things out that I would cover uh, verbally in the class. I decided to put together this electrical book called Shortcuts. <clears throat> and when the printer uh, looked at my first draft and he saw 250 pages, he said, you can't go any higher than 250 pages without creating a larger book and uh, binding would be a problem and, and all kinds of other issues. So I stopped the book at about 250 pages. But shortcuts is what I call it, electrical troubleshooting shortcuts, because I'm going to show you some shortcuts on how to troubleshoot battery cranking and charging problems and take into account some of the new technology that you deal with every day and show you that it's really not that difficult because shortcuts cuts through all the fuzz and get you down to the nitty-gritty on what's wrong with the particular circuit. So the book shortcuts is what we're going to look at today and and the diagrams that I show you will be from shortcuts and this is an outline of the book shortcuts. It's seven sections and we're going to look at section four, five, and six we're going to do the section four first, in which I show you some quick troubleshooting of battery circuits. 
and then after that we'll do section 5 quit troubleshooting cranking circuits and section 6 quit troubleshooting charging circuits and in all these examples I use some shortcuts and that's what will be presented so why is shortcuts successful teaching vehicle electrical troubleshooting because it it takes into account two important factors if you're going to troubleshoot any circuit on any vehicle I don't care if it's a, a car a pickup an SUV uh, even a commercial vehicle running on a 12 volt system uh, it or a 24 volt system it the two things you need to know about the particular circuit that's giving you trouble is what are the voltages we call them circuit voltages and voltage drops these values of voltage about a circuit give you a clear picture of that part of the circuit that is that problem in the circuit that is revealed by the voltage readings and the second thing is the electron current in the circuit at different times of circuit operation when you have these two factors these two values determined and you compare them against a known good value from a good circuit then any electrical problem is easily understood and quickly repaired and what makes this so effective and helpful is all you need is a DMM and a current clamp and it's surprising sometimes when technicians realize with a DMM and a current clamp I can do all of this troubleshooting and I don't need all that expensive test equipment that's often uh, sometimes not available some of the independent shops do not have the access to very sophisticated and uh, cumbersome diagnostic machines that are used to help a technician diagnose the problem all you need is a digital multimeter and a current clamp which you see here uh, the meter on the left is um, just a basic digital multimeter nothing fancy and the current clamp on the right is absolutely essential if you don't have a current clamp you need to get one because the two together allows you to get a full picture of the voltages in a circuit and also the electron current values in order to draw a complete picture as to what's wrong with a circuit when it's not working right all right let's talk about uh, quick troubleshooting charging circuits and again we, 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 we're trying to come up with test procedures that can be performed with all all you need is a DMM and a current clamp so to begin with the role of the generator you see here at uh, an illustration again this is from shortcuts it's uh, and it's explained here that uh, the electrical system as it pertains to the generator in the circuit we've drawn it here in a simplified version uh, to be able to comprehend the voltages and the electron currents that relate to this circuit and uh, if we know what the values are supposed to be we can troubleshoot this circuit and identify anything relating to a generator circuit or generator failure okay what's inside a generator well there there's four major components you see they're they're marked here with numbers number one is you have the rotor coil and the rotor coil is inside the stator winding and uh, the rotor coil is called the rotor because it rotates the stator winding is called a stator because it's stationary and the second item is the voltage regulator in this case the voltage regulator is inside the generator itself and later on in this presentation I'm going to take that voltage regulator and put it inside a control unit and explain how that circuit works and how to test it awesome but to start with we're going to have to go through uh, a brief overview you'll notice that uh, you have uh, six diodes they're three in a row uh, the the top diodes they connect to the B plus terminal on the generator 
so we call those the positive diodes and down below that the negative diodes they connect to the B minus or the ground of the generator so we call those the minus diodes the negative diodes and these six diodes form what we call the diode bridge and if you notice at the junction of each diode the, there's two diodes in series a positive diode is in series with a negative diode and at the junction of the two diodes there's a wire that goes to one of the terminals on the stator so we have uh, three stator windings we have three sets of positive and negative diodes each one dedicated to one of the terminals on the stator now these diodes perform a function called rectification and that means rectification is when you change AC to DC so the generator as uh, it's operating what happens is the voltage regulator number two there will control an electron current flowing through number one the rotor and when the rotor is turning when the pulley is rotating the rotor is rotating inside the stator winding and it generates AC voltage into the stator and that voltage is tapped off and presented to each of the three uh, diode networks and what the diodes do they take that AC and rectify it into DC so we get DC at the generator terminal up at the top so you know we, we 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 spend a little bit of time here in shortcuts explaining this in more detail but I think you got the gist of it and you know the nice thing about it today the average technician doesn't have to break open a generator and replace anything inside the generator we just take a rebuild unit put it on the vehicle and we're done but it's nice to know what's going on the inside because that's going to help us when we have a computer talking to the generator that presents a whole new family of problems we need to discuss sure all right so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test the generator voltage well <clears throat> I'm going to measure that charging voltage at the battery terminals with the engine running it usually it's easy to get to battery terminals uh, if if the battery is hidden in the engine compartment well, you can't see it hardly there'll at least be a positive post up in the engine block somewhere on top of the engine and it'll be designated as positive uh, measure from that terminal but with the engine running I'm going to measure the charging voltage and <clears throat> this is very very important because the charging voltage is the energy provider that controls everything on the on the vehicle the battery does not contribute anything in terms of electrical power to the vehicle system so here we are with uh, a reading of 14.28 uh, in shortcuts we go into uh, quite a bit of explanation why this voltage will be 13.5 on one car and on that same car you might see 14.6 uh, it's all relating to the ambient temperature in cold weather because jet batteries tend to charge uh, more uh, with more difficulty when they're cold they're chemically numb so the charging voltage will be adjusted higher to jam that electron current through that cold battery and charge it up if it didn't do that in cold weather you'd have dead batteries all over the place and in warm weather because the battery is warm and it charges a lot easier the generator voltage will come down if it didn't we would charge the battery at too high a rate when it's hot and boil away the water and have constant battery failures so the charging voltage does have to adjust according to the ambient temperature and we have a flip chart first things first that walks a technician through all the diagnostics of a charging system analysis we're just going to hit the tip of the iceberg here it's all explained in shortcuts as well as in the flip chart 
So right now, the generator is running. It's providing me with a proper charging voltage, which you're going to say, well, what is the charging voltage for a given make and model car at a given ambient temperature? Well, good luck finding a chart that tells you that. What you're going to do is you're going to test the charging voltage on every vehicle that comes in your service bay just to see what the voltage is on this make and model with the ambient temperature of the day. And you get to learn they're going to be somewhere, you're going to have a certain range of voltage that you can accept. Now, if this charging voltage is too high, then you're going to have uh, failures related to higher than normal voltage, which would be uh, examples when the uh, computers on board the vehicle are going to be damaged by getting too hot. When I did the ECM rebuilding program for General Motors back in the early 80s when uh, we set up that program here in Dallas for General Motors, we had uh, computers be delivered to us every Friday from the warehouse, and we would rebuild them, put them in a remand box, and send them back to the warehouse. Well, it turns out that it, there were times when computer would come in and the operator would be sitting at a terminal writing up a work order on the, on the unit itself, and it would rattle. And so they called me over and said, hey, this one rattles. And I took the covers off, and guess what happened? The solder melted on the circuit board, and some of the components fell out of the circuit board. So that ruined the computer. And the next week, we got another shipment in, and there was another computer that rattled. What happened? The charging voltage in that vehicle melted the new computer that was in it. So these are the kind of things that we don't want to happen when we have to buy that computer and put it in the customer's car. We don't want it to go bad because of overcharging. So we need to be monitoring the charging voltage. Now, being too high can damage electronic circuits. Well, if it's too low, circuits won't work properly. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the program here. So here we are, we're checking charging voltage. We're in a proper range. We know from experience what the range is supposed to be, and we're good to go as far as the voltage is concerned. Now, in, in shortcuts, we go into uh, different situations where you put a, a normal electrical load on the generator and watch the voltage come down and so on like that, but that's something you'll have to study and develop a little bit later on. Now, as far as testing the generator electron current, look what I'm doing. I'm now testing the current that I'm concerned about is the current that goes through the battery. Because if that current through the battery, as I showed you earlier, is too high, I'm going to smoke the diodes in the generator. And I'll replace the generator and leave the bad battery in the car. Even though it's cranking the engine, there's no clue that there's something wrong with the battery because it's starting the engine. And I measure the charging voltage, and I see normal charging voltage. It might be a tenth or two less, but it's not something that would cause any alarm that I've got a problem. So when I check this circuit, notice something different about the grounding of the battery negative terminal. I have one ground that goes to the engine block, and then I have a second ground that goes to the accessory ground, or the sheet metal. Now the electron current comes off the generator leaving the negative terminal traveling through the engine block going up the engine ground and at this point the current splits. Some current number one is going to go through the battery number two the majority of the current is going to go down the accessory ground and supply all the electron current to all the electrical system on the vehicle, everything grounded to sheet metal. So I have electron current flowing up the engine ground and down the accessory ground. Now in shortcuts we explain these current clamps and if you have two wires inside the jaws and current is going in two different directions, the current clamp is going to subtract one current from the other. You're going to see only the difference. So when I surround the current clamp over the engine ground and the accessory ground, I see the current that's going through the battery. So this is kind of like the current that you showed 
uh, and in the first segment, when you're looking at the the uh, overall the net charge rate and its impact on on uh, alternator damage and yes. and identifying a, a bad battery. Sure, this is the same the same principle. The only difference here is we have the engine ground and accessory ground together connected at the negative terminal. Sure. A lot of vehicles are wired this way. So what you do is you surround both of the cables and the reading on the meter is the current that's flowing through the battery. Because right. what, what happens is the all the current up the engine ground uh, is subtract uh, subtracts the current clamp subtracts the current going the other way through the accessory ground. So the reading is what's left going through the battery. Right. Okay. And I guess yeah. I guess if you wanted to make sure that you had your clamp oriented in the right direction before you take this test, um, you could just leave the engine off and you know turn the key on. Maybe throw some accessories like the blower motor and the headlights, uh, and you should read a discharge, right? Well, if if you if you did it with the current clamp right now, the same current going up the engine ground. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're correct. I, I jumped the track. Yeah, the if the engine is not running, then all the current for the blower, the headlights, and all that will come down the accessory ground, and you would see then the total current that the battery is supplying to the vehicle circuits that you have turned on. Right. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that anyone who's using this technique and has they need to understand the importance of where they're placing the current clamp. For example, if you moved it um, past the splice to just the cable coming from the generator, that would be one reading. Or the, the part feeding the, the engine car systems, that would be another reading, right. which is where you have it. And, and the orientation, if you turn that clamp over, it could go from positive to a negative number. So if you want to make sure that you're reading the right number, make sure that you have the clamp oriented correctly to begin with by doing that simple check. You just turn the key on, engine off, you know, throw some lights on, the blower motor on, you should get a negative amperage reading. That way when you go ahead and perform this test, uh, you should see under that, that under 10 amp figure that you gave earlier as yeah. the net, what's left, what's, uh, what's left over, if you will, to, to feed the battery. Right. And you know, doing this test once you put the current clamp on the two cables together, start the engine, you can stop and fill out your work order and let it just sit there and idle and, and see how low the current comes down while you're filling out the work order. You don't have to stand there and waste time. Uh, sure. Because the battery's going to charge up, and what it's drawing at that point is what you want to know, that it's less than 10 amps. Now, the question comes up, I'm sure, in some people's minds, well, how high can it go before I got to worry about it? Well, you know, we've seen situations where uh, some batteries will pull 16, 17 amps. And because I've had the luxury of playing with this idea, when I'd go out and do uh, training in different fleets, we'd have the same vehicle all week long. Right. And so sometimes we'd go out and check a car, and it would have a uh, 15, 16 amp draw like this. And then by the end of the week, in which we've been running the vent engine and doing tests and so on, we check it again and see it has come down. So sometimes batteries that are a low state of charge, which you could determine by the OCB test we talked about earlier, if you have a low OCB reading, this reading is going to be kind of high because the battery's got to charge up. When it reaches its charge, then it's when it starts to drop down to less than 10 amps. So somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 amps, I'm a little bit antsy. I, I, you know, 12 amps, I don't worry about it. 14 amps, no, I don't worry about it. 18, 19 amps, I'm a little bit concerned. I might want to leave it run for a while or maybe even turn the car off and put a trickle charger on the battery for a few hours and see if that doesn't help the battery charge back up. Uh, but I've seen, of course, uh, in the mid-20s, I've seen those batteries take enough off the generator and cause a generator failure. It might take sure. longer, whereas a, a battery pulling 50 amps is going to take about one day of driving. 
So you have to weigh all those factors. But over 20 amps, I'm, begin I'm beginning to get concerned about a battery being excessive draw causing a, could cause a generator failure. Now, if the vehicle has a small little lightweight generator, you want this current to be under 10 amps. But if you got a diesel pickup with a big old hefty generator that's feeding two different batteries, it's probably going to handle a lot more. It probably handle 20 amps recharge current because in that case you're going to have two different batteries, right? So you would check the recharge current in each battery cable and add it together. But each one, each individual battery, if you have two in parallel, each individual battery should drop le draw less than 10 amps in five within five minutes. Sure. So and you, George, you, you can check that. Here. Yeah. Yeah, you can check that. And 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 like you pointed out, a lot of his experience, what's the background complaint? You know, is the vehicle having issues, you know, going through their generators? Does the generator, you know, fail and you're putting a new one on? You know, you want to check this to see if that might have been a contributing factor. Uh, you know, all of this has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, it, it does require some experience and some time. And shortcuts <clears throat> gives you a lot of explanation that I don't have time to elaborate here. Absolutely. But you know you'll you'll have that resource to turn to, to develop that experience level quickly, so you can confidently identify a problem, and that that's you know there's no way you can teach experience. You have to uh, in the test procedures that we teach in the workshops when we're out with a fleet, for example, or even in a workshop here in Dallas, the techs have to go out on the vehicles and do the test. Sure. Just talking about it and watching a picture doesn't get it. We get out there in the vehicles, run the test, and then in this example here, what I'll do often when, when I'm in a classroom environment or in a workshop, we'll turn the engine off and we'll turn on the lights, AC high blower, uh, flashers, wipers, and hold it for about a minute and pull the battery down. Mm -hmm. And then we'll turn everything off, start the engine again, and watch the inrush current be very high and take longer to come down because the battery is recharging and replenishing the energy it had to give up during sure. that minute of drain. And so that gives you a lot of feeling for this particular uh, test and it doesn't take much time. But notice what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're cons when we talk about an electron current test for the generator, I'm not putting a carbon pile on the battery terminals to see right. how many amps I get off the generator. That doesn't tell me anything. Right. It, it, what it tells me doesn't help me fix this car or determine that this car is operating within its proper parameters. Sure. See, So this is what I need to worry about with the generator, how much current it has to feed the battery. That's what say, you have to worry about. And I would ask too that it, on the reverse side of that, doing this test, you have your current clamp oriented. You know that it's facing the right direction, give you the correct positive or negative reading, and you see a negative number. Then obviously the generator is not giving you what uh, what you need to to keep the system full. Well, then you have no voltage, and you need to see that with the voltmeter test. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible to have an alternator that's putting out is putting something out, but not enough? Yeah. I mean, it might, maybe it passes the voltage test, but you'd still get a, a bad current. A negative current reading on this test? No, no. If when when the generator is barely putting out, I've seen generators put out 12.7, 12.8. Now, sure, that tells me that's coming off the generator. If the generator were dead, and I was on battery voltage only, I'd be 12.66, but then it would quickly start to drop down. Sure. But when you see 12.7, 12.8, that tells you that generator is barely producing any energy. And when you sure. take this reading here, you're not going to see any kind of significant current because there's not enough voltage to power the system. Uh, you, you'll see some, but it won't be the proper reading because the battery's not being stressed at the normal charging voltage. Yeah, and I guess to, 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 to clarify that as well, if everything is working as it should, then the alternator's not putting out all that much anyway. You're looking enough to cover the system needs and a little bit more. So if even if you have a 150 amp rated alternator, 
and you're performing you know, a test on the charging system, normal operating conditions, it's not putting out anywhere near that. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and the way to test it is what, what the battery is doing to the generator. Somebody will say sure. to me, uh, well, what if, what if I have a circuit on the vehicle that's drawing too much current? All right, think about that for a second. Isn't that circuit fused? Sure. So that fuse would blow mm -hmm. and shut that circuit off, and you'd know that you've got a circuit on the vehicle drawing too much current. So I don't need to worry about that. Those fuses mm -hmm. are going to tell me if one of those circuits is pulling too much current when it blows. Right. What I'm concerned about is how much the battery is taking off the generator when I'm driving down the road. Now, and just, add, just to add a side note there, because now you got me thinking a little weird. What about people who wire in all sorts of accessories and actually increase the vehicle demand? Like the boom boxes. Yeah, whatever they might be, the amplifiers, the, the who knows, you know, the onboard ice boxes. Sure. Whatever they might be. And you're performing this test. Maybe your figure is still under that, that 10 amp, but the alternator is, is putting out a higher than, than what it's used to. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's something else that you'd have to be aware of. What accessories are wired into the vehicle? Yes, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, these boom boxes, you can hear them a block away coming down the street. <laughs> and they use an immense amount of energy. Every time they hit a base note, that generator is being told to put out a high rate of current. Sure. Now, that, that current will not show up on this reading because the current is going to flow through the engine ground right and down the accessory ground so it's going to subtract you're still only going to see what's going to the battery if you want to know how much the generators putting out when all these loads are turned on you have to put the current clamp up on the positive cable of the generator sure absolutely now, some people tell me that that's how I check the charging system I put the cable up there on the uh, cable coming off the B plus terminal on the generator and I see how many amps I got flowing well that reading is going to change with how much of an electrical load is on the vehicle and if somebody put uh, uh, some accessories on the vehicle extra lights and so on as that that reading is going to be higher than normal because sure. of the extra accessories so th that that is not something to do to diagnose the generator we want to know the generator's performance with its normal factory load that the engineers designed into the system. If people add extra accessories to the vehicle, then you have to treat those as a separate issue. Sure. But normally, this will this will suffice for finding a battery problem that's causing that generator to fail. Yeah, and I guess that uh, another option, like we always say, if you want to understand a, a testing method that you're not familiar with, the best place to do it is on cars you know don't have a problem. And, you know, well, yeah, just, that's where, yeah, yeah, that's do, where you get the known good readings. Right, do this, make it, make a habit of doing this on every car that comes in your bay. If, if it's a tire rotation, you take a moment to apply these techniques until they become second nature for you. And, and for that, you're, you're going to see so many instances of good that when you do see the bad one, it's going to stand out. Absolutely, and and you know that that is another issue that <clears throat> we we talk about, but we don't emphasize enough. When a car's in the shop and you've done something to fix it, and you're ready to give it back to the customer, take a minute and do this test for practice. Check mm -hmm. the charging voltage. Uh, I used to. Uh, when, when we first got into computer control, I used to check the 5 volt reference. I wanted to know on different make and model cars how that 5 volt reference would check with my voltmeter. And so mm -hmm. you, you just do this as part of your uh, personal development. You know, it's like it's like doing homework. Uh, if you only spend a couple of minutes on a vehicle before you give it back to the customer and test something, you've learned so much. And you practice, and, and that's how you develop the experience level that you need to be sure. really fast and accurate. One last thing on this current clamp, Pete. I want to talk that, uh, tell you that when you when you flip the current clamp over, 
the current clamp is, is somewhat sensitive to the direction of electron flow through the jaws. Sure. So if you, if you hook it up backwards, you're going to see a minus sign in front of the five. Now, the, the, the thing is, if you're reading a small current and you have the current clamp backwards where the minus sign is showing, then you might have a slightly lower than normal reading. So what I tell people to do is flip the current clamp the other way and see which reading is the highest. That's the most accurate. Oh, oh neat trick. Never heard of that one. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. All right, let's move on now. We've done battery voltage testing, which we call charging system voltage tests. And now we're testing the generator's electron current that is feeding to the battery, which can be that sneaky little current draw that could take out a generator. <clears throat> now, let's suppose I've determined that due to my voltage analysis that my charging voltage is too high or too low, one or the other. And that's the way it's addressed in shortcuts. What if it's too low? What if it's too high? Well, normally, let's talk about what you're going to see for voltage readings. Notice meter number one is checking the voltage drop of the voltage side from the positive post of the battery to the positive terminal on the back of the generator. I want to see about 0 0.2 volts there. This is with the engine running, mm -hmm. of course. And then I'll check the ground side of the charging circuit by measuring from battery negative to the case of the generator. And on the ground side, I want to see about 0 0.1. Now, those two voltage readings are normal. We've done this on vehicles, all make and models. And we find these numbers to be fairly accurate as to the condition of the charging system. Uh, if, for example, we have a bad connection on the voltage side of the charging system, it could be in the positive cable on the positive post of the battery. It could be the cable on the back of the generator. Any connections between the two, this reading, number DMM number one, is going to be higher than 0 0.2. Now, if I see 0 0.25, I don't get too upset. But I see right. 0 0.3, 0 0.4. From experience, I'm telling you, things need to be looked at. Uh -huh. It's nothing more clean contacts and, and connections. The same thing on the ground side. Uh, if that negative cable between the engine, the engine block and the negative terminal of the battery, if that cable is becoming... Uh, uh, corroded and developing resistance, its voltage drop is going to go up. And meter number two, DMM number two, will be higher than 0 0.1. Now, I'll tell you something about this simple diagnostics. If there's a bad connection between the generator and the battery, one of these two readings is going to be high to say it's on the voltage side if it's number one, or it's on the ground side if it's meter number two. So right away, you identify which side of the charging circuit has the problem. Saves an immense amount of time. And I can tell you one story of a technician. Uh, he even called me to tell me about this one. Uh, there was a, a Ford, uh, I'm sorry, a Plymouth uh, SUV. And <clears throat> the uh, transmission wouldn't shift. So the transmission shop took the vehicle in. They did a complete rebuild on the transmission, put it back in, and guess what? It still wouldn't shift. <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of people hear that, and they're saying, well, that happened to me. Well, look, this is what happened to this friend of mine. Uh, he came to these classes, my workshops, and he learned all this troubleshooting stuff. So he had a reputation in town as being a guy who could fix electrical problems. So this this other transmission shop said, if we bring the car over, would you let your tech look at it? And the two owners knew each other. They helped each other out. So he said, sure, bring it over. So they brought the vehicle over. And uh, when it came in the shop, the owner said, well, pull the transmission, take it back there to, to our R&R uh, our tech, I mean our, our rebuilder, and he'll fix it. Well. The rebuilder heard the word, and he said, no, no. He went up front and said, no, don't, don't do that. Just give me the keys. So he took the car around back, and he started doing these voltage checks using the flip chart first things first. And in one of the steps, you're doing this first reading here, 
DMM number one, checking from the positive post of the battery to the back of the generator. When he did the reading, he got 0 0.6 volts. Well, that's way too high. Uh -huh. So he started looking at the connections. When he got to the back of the generator on the B plus terminal, he noticed that it had been assembled incorrectly. So he took it apart, reassembled it, put it all back together again, started the engine back up, did the voltage drop check, it had 0 0.2. He drove it around, proved it was shifting, went back inside, flipped the keys on the counter, went back to rebuilding that other transmission he was working on, said it's fixed. It took him about 10 minutes. Yeah, wow. Well, the, you know, the other shop couldn't fix it. They'd all spent that money, that time, in rebuilding a transmission. So the question is, why wouldn't the transmission shift when voltage drop number one was 0 0.6 volts? And the simple answer is this. You've got to understand about a solenoid. When a solenoid is energized, the initial inrush current to a solenoid needs to be high because, first of all, a solenoid is going to oppose a rise in current. So when you have enough energy through the solenoid, the solenoid will shift quickly. But if it's if it's got low voltage or if it's got a low current draw, then the solenoid will be sluggish when it shifts. And if you have a transmission solenoid that's shifting sluggish, guess what? The transmission doesn't shift properly or it shifts right. late. Right. So that simple connection was preventing the generator from a, supplying the current that that solenoid needed. And a simple connection fixed the problem. So we tell people that work on transmissions for a living, you need this electrical troubleshooting just like the drivability technician because you've got the same problems to deal with that he does. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So now uh, this is what we do if we have any kind of a problem with the charging voltage being too high or too low. Look for a bad connection before you do anything else. Now let's talk about computer control. And when they have computer control, that means that they take the voltage regulator out of the, con the generator and put it inside a control unit. It could be the PCM, the BCM, the BCM, all these different CMs. It <laughs> doesn't matter. They're going to put a voltage regulator circuit inside the control unit, and that transistor now is doing the same thing it was doing when it was mounted inside the generator. It provides the electron current that flows th through the rotor winding. If this generator has to put out a lot of energy because the operator, the driver, has his high beam headlights on, the wipers are going, the, air the, the heater high blower is going, it's, you know, it's worst case scenario driving, then the transistor is going to be supplying a lot of current through the rotor winding to make the energy that all these electrical circuits need. So <clears throat> when the electrical load then reduces because it turns all the accessories off, the generator will have to have a low, doesn't need to have that high output, so the current through the rotor winding drops a little bit and reduces the output, and that transistor is doing all of that, being controlled by the PCM or the BCM. Well, what's going to happen then if a car comes in and the generator is not working? You got, you got your uh, generator codes, no charging. You, you check the charging voltage and you see 12.5 volts with the engine running, which is telling you the generator is not even producing anything. It's dead. Well, uh, in the old days, uh, you could take that generator off and put a new one on that had the voltage regulator inside it. So if you had a regulator problem, you got a new one when you replaced the generator. But here, the generator and the voltage regulator are two separate items. Which one is the problem? That's the issue. Now, I, I, I spend some time with this in, in shortcuts, elaborately explaining it all. But for the purposes of our time here, let me just cut down to the, the bottom line here. 
this transistor driver inside the PCM is supplying the current through the rotor. Now, it could be that the transistor in the voltage regulator, it fails on its own. It can happen. There's nothing wrong with the generator. But it's also possible that something happens to the rotor winding inside the generator, so it draws excessive current. In other words, its resistance goes down. So that's going to put a strain on the transistor. The transistor fails. So now the car comes in the shop, and he's got a bad rotor winding inside the generator and a bad transistor uh, voltage regulator inside the control unit. If he plugs in a new control unit, he might get a little bit of charging out of the system and think it's fixed. And then in a day or later, the, tr the, the new computer goes out because the problem is still in the rotor winding inside the generator. So it's the rotor winding that we're concerned about that might take out the voltage regulator and I don't want to replace the control unit without testing the rotor winding to make sure it's good. Simple. All you need is a multimeter. Next page. Look here. See what I've done? I've disconnected the control unit and here I am checking on pin 5. Okay, that was my cell phone. I was worried that maybe you call me because we lost <laughs> video or something. Okay, sorry about that. No, no. All right, so we, we unplug the, the F terminal from the generator. Now, the key is off, but you notice the generator is still tied to B+. Plus. So I can do this test with the key off. And what am I going to do? I'm going to take my 20 amp function on my multimeter and I'm going to put it on the F terminal with the red lead and ground the black lead. Now what's that going to do? That's going to send maximum current through the fuel winding, the rotor winding, sometimes we call it the field, and, and that rotor is going to warm up. That current reading is going to be somewhere around 5 amps and I don't want to see that current go up. If that current starts to go up, that's telling me when the rotor start to wear and get hot, it's starting to break down and draw high current. So I have to change the generator at the same time I change the control unit. Mm -hmm. If this current stays the same, well then I know the rotor winding is okay when it gets hot. It didn't take out the transistor driver in the voltage regulator. Simple procedure. Yeah, neat idea. Just using your multimeter as a uh, not and only a, to 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 read the current flow, but it's the control. You're actually be able to make that switch contact. Sure. Simple procedure to, to verify that that rotor winding is good. Because if that rotor winding turns bad when it gets hot, the meter's going to draw higher than normal current. It's going to start to go up. Sure. And that's a dead giveaway. And as a little side note for anyone who, who's watching, too, yes, there's a fuse in your meter just in case you know something goes awry, but it doesn't hurt to make yourself up a little fusible link test lead that you can use. It's a lot cheaper to replace that little mini fuse than it is to replace the fuse in your meter or the meter itself. So consider sure. that as well. Now, the other thing I want to suggest here, and I mentioned this in shortcuts, and when you're doing this test, don't walk away. Yeah. Sit there and watch it. Because if the current starts to go up, you don't have to wait till it peaks at seven or eight, ten amps. You don't have to wait for that. Sure. You need you need to replace it. Because this this little meter uh, function here with the twenty amps, I explained it in shortcuts how it's a resistor inside there that gets hot. Mm -hmm. and if it gets too hot, it'll melt the circuit board and damage your meter so you want to watch it and if it gets up five six seven eight amps you know that that uh, generator has a bad rotor and you're going to replace it at the same time you replace the uh, computer so you see the oops sorry went the wrong way I just want to make sure that everybody understands that just because they put the voltage regulator inside a control unit 
it gives the computer better control over the charging system, but it doesn't change anything about the generator. It's still the same old, same old. Sure. Okay. Well, that's that's what I've got so far for this section on uh, shortcuts for uh, troubleshooting the charging system, but diagnosing between a computer control voltage regulator and a separate generator, that's something that most people really need to focus on and practice this technique because you don't have to blow a control unit plugging it into a car with a bad rotor winding in the generator. And this is a copy of the book Vehicle Electrical Troubleshooting Shortcuts. Uh, you can go to our website beedger.com in fact, you'll see there's a link there for the uh, on the left side of the page. There's a link that says Electrical Shortcuts, and you can click on that. You can read all about the book, all the different topics it's covered, and a brief overview beyond what I've given you here. This is this is more elaborate because I'm going through some of the diagrams, but uh, this book's been on the market for uh, quite a while. Right now, the price is still 78, and uh, you can order right off the website. Yeah, and for those who are watching, um, you know, Vince has been doing this for a long time. He offers classroom instruction uh, back down there in his Dallas, Texas location. Uh, and he also offers a, a lot of other resources. Uh, let me just share that with everybody here. Uh, at his website at vidger.com, so by all means, check those resources out. Vince, really thank you so much for taking the time to share this information. Even if these were just little snippets of what's available in that book. Uh, what a great resource for text. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. Well, thank you, Pete. Nice to be with you.